The 70th anniversary Wexford Opera Festival opens on Tuesday in Wexford. It's entitled Shakespeare in the Heart, will feature operas, concerts, pop-up events and lectures and a photographic exhibition of the early years of the festival. It's now anchored in the National Opera House in Wexford, opened in 2008 and another, indeed, legacy of the festival itself. It's all a far cry from the humble beginnings of 70 years ago in 1951, which we'll be featuring on this morning's programme. From the RTE Sound Archives, how one man fashioned an opera festival, now known all over the world. Dr Tom Walsh. When I went to Blindbourne, and that was in 1939, and I remember the first opera I saw there was the Nazi di Figaro. And I've never been so, if you like, impressed by anything, because never had I could, could I imagine a production of an opera to be so beautiful, so exquisite in style, decor, costumes, and so logical. That was Glyndebourne, 1939, pre-war, a little over a decade later, but a long decade. Tom Walsh was in Foyle's bookshop in London, 1951. And I saw there a program of uh, the Alborough Festival of 1949. And on the cover of this program, there was a drawing of a lifeboat being pushed out to sea. And it reminded me of something I had often seen in Wexford when I was a boy. But however, on that particular evening, I was going down to spend the night with Compton Mackenzie, who then lived in Denchworth. And I got the idea that we could have a little festival in Wexford. In, and I asked him, would he help? And he agreed, and he did. And that is how the Wexford Festival was born. Um, well, I'm not going to keep you any longer now from uh, Mr. Compton Mackenzie. And once more, I wish to congratulate everyone concerned for a splendid performance. Erskine Childers, later fourth president of Ireland at the first Wexford Festival. Well, it's been a really grand evening. I think that, first of all, we must... The, the man who's... Um, here he is. Look at him. <laughs> Sir Compton Mackenzie at the opening of the Wexford Opera Festival in 1951, paying his tribute to Tom Walsh. And here in another archive interview from that year is Tom Walsh and talking about the beginnings of the Wexford Opera Festival. Last November, we tried to form an opera study circle here, and my good friend, Mr. Compton Mackenzie, came and gave us an inaugural address. Well, the opera st circle has gone on quite well since, but it is really just a means to an artistic end. For what we have in mind is the formation of a musical festival, which we hope, it's very much in the air at the moment, but. We hope that by next, say, October or November, that for some four or five days, we will have a musical festival running here in the town. And in another archive interview recorded in 1980, Tom Walsh discussed his boyhood in Wexford and how dull it all had been. I was born and lived, I've lived all my life in Wexford. And Wexford, when I was very young, was a very dull country town. And one of the reasons why I loved going to the theatre, that there was light there. Now, you see, if you take, if you take a town like Wexford when I was young, one had gas in, say, the first two floors. You lived, as I still live, in a three-storey house. You had gas on the first two floors, which wasn't very bright anyway, but one went to bed with a candle or a lamp. And when the electricity goes nowadays and I have to try and read or write with a lamp or candle, I, d I don't know how it was possible that anybody could survive, but that is not right. You went to the theatre and there was a, what seemed to be a blaze of light and it was coloured light. In a number of interviews, Tom Walsh recalls the touring opera companies he remembers in Wexford as a boy. You, you, got, quite, you got quite an impression of opera here, because the theatre was so small, it was all so intimate. 
and because you had no standards to go by and, and also because there's no such thing as even worse, there's no television, no radio. You had some gramophone records perhaps, but this at least was something live and something immediate and something that you could catch on. He had grown up in a musical household. His sister, Nellie Walsh. I was able apparently to play well enough to keep a Sunday afternoon. We used to be at the piano ourselves, the two of us. And uh, we didn't see any reason to do anything else. I think we've been always a bit mixed up with music that it filled up an awful lot. We were there in the beginning of radio and we had a lad working with us who was very good at doing these mechanical things and he built a radio set I remember and we were delighted with ourselves. That was before you, before you bought the things. I think there were only cat's whisker ones or something at that stage and uh, I remember occasionally Tom would call me, I've got Bologna on the, on the, on the wireless come up at that time even. I wouldn't uh, be listening to a Yes. He didn't even know where Bologna was. <laughs> Neither did I only. We knew vaguely in Italy type of thing. Probably the most important musician we have ever had living in Wexford, William Michael Dove. He actually came from Dublin to here at a very early age and uh, had his first music lessons here. They were given to him by a bandmaster in the militia band here, a man called Meadows. At that time in Wexford, the militia band was very, very good. About lived for about something like two or three years here, I think. And during that time, he incidentally composed his first music here, a small piece of palaka, which was played by the band. The Theatre Royal in Wexford, which actually was built in 1832, was a rather small building, but I suppose it was quite adequate for what would have been a small town back in, in, in that time. But it had its limitations, as the piano tuner George Redmond well knew. And I remember on one occasion being with Dr Walsh, he talked about uh, his interest in developing opera within the area. And not many people, of course, thought at the time that he would ever see it brought to fruition. Aidan Folan, then a young sound engineer with Raddy Warren, recalled his first impressions. Raddy Warren had been inveigled into broadcasting the first Wexford festival. Then, having arrived in Wexford and left my bag at the hotel, I went immediately to see the venue for the Wexford Festival Opera. When I got to the foyer of the theatre, there were people very, very busy with hammers, etc., etc. There were the ladies uh, putting up floral decorations of dried flowers and so on. And then I stepped into the theatre and nearly ran home. I couldn't believe how small the theatre was, how acoustically dead it was even before an audience came in, and in general the place, to put it mildly, was badly in need of uh, a cleaning. Then I came back to the hotel, which was White's Hotel, and it turned out to be a most marvellous centre for the Wexford Festival. In 1951, the then Radio Wern, which was, as the civil servants would say, part of the Department of Post and Telegraph's wireless broadcasting section, was not equipped to deal with opera and things of that nature as outside broadcasts. I had just returned from the BBC where I had been sent for training. I joined in September of 51 and the Wexford Festival dropped into my lap some six weeks later. The equipment in use nowadays would be regarded as very, very antique and therefore made it extremely difficult to separate the orchestral accompaniments from the performance on stage. We eventually ended up in a corner under the stage in Stygian darkness. Another visitor to Wexford for the first festival was Frank Murphy, horn player with the Radioware and Light Orchestra, and emissary of the then Director of Music, Faulkner O'Hanrakoin. It was great excitement for months beforehand. Faulkner O'Hanrakoin instructed me to go down and find out what it was all about. 
So I went down the first time and I met Dr Walsh and Eugene McCarthy to discuss Radio Weirden's involvement in the thing. So I met them many times after that until we came to the actual shows itself and the two weeks. We spent two weeks there and we loved the place. We really loved the place. And uh, I got the job then. I was playing horn. I was also doing manager and librarian. The first thing is I had to order the music and we got the music from Goodwin and Tabs in London. And it appeared to me that the whole town was involved in Wexford in those days. They would do the carpentry work. It was a desolate place. It was a shabby theatre. Uh, there was no room for the orchestra, so we took out seats to make a pit. And they, they, I think it was one of the uh, chorus actually was doing the carpentry work. Uh, Nick, Nick Rossiter, I think. And we put a curtain across, and that became an orchestral pit. Frank Murphy remembering Wexford from the documentary by Marcus MacDonald. The ubiquitous Dr Tom Walsh was, of course, the driving force behind everything. Aidan Folan again. He seemed to be in several places at once, and I will never forget his reaction on the very first morning, the first orchestral rehearsal, where it was found that the then very sparse in numbers light orchestra could not fit into the space that was allocated for the uh, orchestral pit. He nearly had a seizure, understandably, because he probably was already thinking that he was well on his way to bankruptcy. Eventually he saw the point that he couldn't possibly have the opera without the orchestra, so consequently the seats had to go. Frank Murphy remembers other challenges. Of course, the orchestra was much too loud in that situation for the opera. So afterwards I understood, uh, which they did, I was there for us, they lowered the pit. And of course the pit was a bit too low because Demer O'Hara was a very small man. So we had to raise him on a box so that he could see the stage. But anyway, everything went very well. And the opening night, I remember, and, and the rehearsals, they all, the whole town was part of this. There wasn't just anyone, but the whole town, the queues to get into the dress rehearsals. And the ladies decorated that place, you wouldn't recognise it. And uh, we had a lot of problems with singers, of course, and at that time, because Wexford in those days was very, very cold and damp. There was no central heating anywhere. And the singers all got these colds. And I can remember Dr. Walsh standing in the, in the fire of the theatre, handing out col- coloured tablets to them all. I don't know whether it ever did any good for them or not, but he was, it was a great thing to see him handing out all these multicoloured tablets. Uh, so that was the show. The first night of the show went very well, but uh, it was a great success, and uh, the orchestra was too loud. We had to admit that. Then there was other things happened. Uh, the floor of the stalls wasn't an ideal place because people were looking over the railings at us. Of course, the people of Wexford were our great friends, and they really took us in tow and looked after us. They took us to the heart. We were great friends with all the people of Wexford. Another great character was our conductor, Dermot O'Hara. Now, Dermot would every day parade up and down the main street with a, a yellow crumby overcoat cast around the shoulders, black sunglasses, and a red uh, berry in the middle of October, which was great amusement for the locals. They loved them. Every time they came up, you could see them stopping and staring and laughing. I went down and had a look at the theatre, which had been a theatre with, with boxes, and then it was transferred, changed to a cinema. Norris Davidson was also involved. Anyhow, it seemed to me very dark and very damp and impossible. And, of course, it looked so much smaller than it does. It doesn't look terribly big now, but very much smaller. We had to work below the stage, I and Aidan Fowler, which was rather horrifying because... Um, we could not only hear through a thin partition, we could hear the orchestra playing, but through equally thin stage floor, we could hear them singing and walking about over our heads. Um, we sat on a bench, it looked to me as well as I remember, it was an army table on an army bench, very close to some heaps, sacks of coke, and there was a door that opened out onto the, onto the yard. It was a wonder how... Um, it was put on. The Wexford Festival of Music and the Arts, the Theatre Royal, Wexford, the 1st of November, 
The Rose of Castile. Quite a remarkable thing, I remember. I was going home one night to White's Hotel. I met Dr. Walsh and the manager of White's coming out, and Brunham said, do you know who we've been talking about? So I said, well, I hope it's about the future of this, and they said it is. It's not what we're going to do next year. It's what we're going to do the year after that. There was faith. I remember him as doing absolutely everything. I mean, I wouldn't have known about the artistic thing. The operas were just an end product but I would know that he had cast them, producers, conductors, designers, therefore he was artistic director. He also supervised the production manager, the technical area of it. I do know he allocated tickets himself, therefore he kept an eye on the box office. He, of course, had to deal with finance. I presume he had people to help him with all these things, but he would have basically had to get the money to put on the festival. He supervised the cleaning of the theatre. He saw that it was right. He gave the cleaners their instructions, what to do. So, literally, he was everything. He was in total control of the whole operation, with a lot of people helping him, but there was no question but that everything went back to Dr. Tom. Tom Welsh, it seems to have sprung out of Tom's head uh, like uh, Athene from, from the head of Jove or wherever it was, because Tom had this extraordinary vision of perfection and of an utterly sure idea of casting. And he could get things done which under any ordinary circumstances couldn't possibly be done. I mean, one of the most remarkable performances of the Daughter of the Red Shows I've ever seen, Tom succeeded in putting on in four, in, in four months with Graziella Schotti and um, Geraint Evans. Uh, he put it on in four months because he didn't know he was going to have a festival, but he, he managed to get the whole yes. thing going, and I think Brian Borkel conducting it. You must remember when we started, there was no money. What money we had was what we had in our pockets, five or six of us. There was no backing from Arts Council or Board Forge or anything like that. I'm not suggesting there should have been, but there just wasn't. And one consequently had one to cut, very much cut one's cloth to measure. And the funny thing was that rights if I can develop that a little. We did the Rose of Castile the first year with a certain amount of uh, criticism, because after all, why not Maritana, why not Bohemian Girl? So uh, having done uh, the Rose of Castile, I decided, oh, where do we go from here? And the attitude of most of the public was, now, okay, right, you've had your year, now Maritana. Now, instead of doing that, I said, no, now L'Elazir de More, and in Italian. And that nearly broke us. You won't believe that. But only on the last night of four performances was the theatre full. And that theatre was full on the last night through the fact that I had luckily picked a very good young tenor who had a very fine career after a tenor called Nicola Monti. But I remember going around Wexford for the first performance and asking people, with, I went around with a very good friend of the festival, Franciscan priest Father Ender, who was here, and calling on people to say, please, will you now come to the first performance? And I must say, fair enough, they did. We had a good first performance. But there were two other performances between, and there were plenty of vacant seats. And our top prize that year was one pound, and you could get all the seats you wanted for ten shillings. And finally, i tell you a very good story. On the very last night, I came down to the theatre. First of all, it, the theatre was absolutely booked out. And I came down as a queue down as far as Rose Street from the theatre, people trying to get in. How they were got in, I don't know, and I probably shouldn't talk about it now with <laughs> fire regulations and the like. But anyway, most were got in. And the last two up to the box office were two men that said that they want. I said, look, you can't possibly get in. I said, we've come all the way from Clonmel. Now, Clonmel was a very long journey to make to Wexford in those days. Nobody was coming from America or constant or anything, but they did come from Clonmel. I said, right, gentlemen, I said, you'll hear, but you won't see. Ten shillings each. And they got, they were delighted to get up as the back, old back stairs that they had then, and they literally just had to stand outside on that stairs. And they didn't see, but they heard. And from then on, people accepted that Italian opera could be enjoyable. And that Donizetti could be enjoyable. 
outside Luci the Lama Mall. Ethna Scallon worked as his assistant from 1961. She found him a meticulous and scholarly worker. One of his gifts, she said... His gift was to pick a voice suitable for that role in this theatre, in that opera. Not just a good voice. And these were notes kept as a result of travelling to various places? Yes, he went around. Uh, mainly he had agents who... He had a lot of Italian singers at the, the time that he was probably at his height around the six, early 60s, late 50s. And he relied quite a lot on his agents to whom he would write or phone and say, I want singers for the following type of roles and I'd like to have them for me on such a date and they would have their singers there. He did that more than going around to operas, although he did that as well. He actually auditioned individuals and had an enormous facility for remembering exactly what type of voice that was. But he would keep his little handwritten notes in his book, which travelled with him all the time. You acted as interpreter. He didn't speak any other language than no, English. No, he didn't. He, in spite of being such a musical person, he didn't actually have a good ear for languages, and uh, he depended on other people. He conveyed his message fairly well, all right, but uh, even on the phone, he would be on one side of me while I phoned Milan, and he would be saying, uh, ask her how much she expects me to pay. And somebody like Ada Fincy at the other end would say, oh, he couldn't come under so many hundred per performance. And I would say this to Tom and the chin would come out and Tom would say, ask her, does she think we're talking about La Scala? Tell her that's rubbish. The most we can possibly offer is such a figure. And I would go back in Italian and pass this on and the whole thing would go to and fro between them. And it would come down to the fact that they knew even at that time that Wexford was a shop window and the singers would come here to be spotted, even though they weren't paid a very high salary. This morning's programme was to mark the 70th anniversary of the Wexford Opera Festival. Corinna Daly's book, The History of Wexford Festival Opera 1951-2021, to is published by Four Courts Press and the photographic exhibition about the early festival is on at the Wexford Library. This morning, we begin with our conclusion to last week's program in which we explored the RTE Sound Archives for the extraordinary beginnings of the Wexford Opera Festival. It owed its beginnings and its early flourishing to one man, a medical doctor and an aesthetist, Dr Tom Walsh. And as we'll hear this morning, it not only embedded the Opera Festival in Wexford, but inspired other festivals across the length and breadth of Ireland. Well, what we have in mind is that for some four or five days... We will have a musical festival running here in the town. Charles Acton, long-time music critic of the Irish Times, believed the Wexford Festival's success and the fact that such a local initiative could flourish had an impact well beyond Wexford. One of the things that was quite remarkable in the 1950s was that Wexford had been a sleepy town in a sleepy county. And thanks to the Wexford Festival, it became, in eight or nine years, a real centre for tourism. And Wexford was the first festival that happened in Ireland. All the other festivals of every sort in the whole of Ireland that happened regularly, Cork, Galway, theatre festivals, cinema festivals, what have you, they were all inspired by Tom Welsh at Wexford. So Tom Walsh's achievement was considerable. His assistant for the early years, Ethna Scallon, recalls the esteem in which the visiting singers held him. They looked on him uh, nearly as the head of the family, in a way. He certainly, in their minds, was an impresario, and they worked very hard here and put up with conditions they mightn't have accepted anywhere else, because I think they realised the fact that he himself would work endlessly. They all got this feeling that if you're with Tom, you're with him the whole way, and he wants high standards, and we have to get there no matter what it costs us. 
Preferably, it should cost very little. Budgets were tight. Wexford Opera's success was built on a shoestring. Jim Golden, honorary chairman in the early years. The backstage workers were generally um, collected up in early September. Most of the workers were local and were voluntary. A lot of the sets at that stage, which were mostly flats, were just made locally, again at no cost. I'd imagine from bits of timber picked up here and there and every place else on canvas. Backstage there would have been one stage manager and one lighting person and the rest of the people were all voluntary workers whom he controlled, to whom he was very kind, but from whom he expected complete dedication, punctuality, the job done well. It was just as if you were in a highly paid job and you had to give 100% commitment to what he wanted. And even if Wexford flourished on voluntary workers, this did not mean that the whole presentation of the event, with so many visitors coming to Wexford, did not bring jobs to the town and the region. Charles Acton again. You, you started with Wexford. Tom Welsh never got a penny out of the Wexford Festival, naturally. Um, nobody got a penny out of the Wexford Festival in Wexford. And, but it, it worked. So with so many unpaid workers involved, it still brought money into Wexford, and that money trickled down. Everybody gained. It lengthened the summer season. Frank Murphy negotiated the costs for RTE. I had to also go down and book guest houses for all the orchestra. And I remember there's some famous ones. There was the fight, and there was also uh, Mrs. Redmond's in Georgia Street, where most of the brass always stayed. Some of us stayed in the Talbot Hotel, where we got a full day's board for seven and sixpence. Well, keen pricing and hard bargaining there on behalf of the then Radio Air and Light Orchestra. Wexford Opera engendered a comradeship, a cooperative spirit. One of those very much involved was Eugene McCarthy, then manager of White's Hotel. Aidan Folan, radio air and engineer, remembered him. Uh, Eugene McCarthy, who was the mater d, as the Americans would call it, was a marvellous, quiet, efficient man, very heavily involved with Tom Walsh and Dr. French in the organisation of the festival. But what struck me most of all, and my happiest memories of the Wexford Festival, was in fact the camaraderie that existed between the visiting principals of the opera, the conductor, the producer, designer and so on, and various members of the orchestra who stayed in the hotel. Meals were a marvellous occasion. There was no setting apart of the principals of the opera at one table and somebody else at another table. There was large table and some side tables you just took your place at whatever point you felt you could sit down and all of this was consistent with the general approach to putting the festival together jim golden again well doing the props then meant that you were handed a long list of objects and things to be got and you just had to produce them there was absolutely no budget for them so you begged you borrowed um, you went to somebody who could do things well with their hands and they made them for you. Um, I remember one time in Don Quixote they needed um, mandolins, four mandolins, and I got three and I had difficulty getting a fourth one. And somebody told me about a certain man who had a mandolin. So I went to him, but he had pawned the mandolin. So I redeemed it from the pawn office for ten shillings. And when the festival was over, I said to Shane Mr. Wire, the then production manager, and I said, I must bring back this mandolin to the man. And he said, you will not, you'll pawn it again for ten shillings and give him back the ticket. But that was the type of, you know, stringent financial control. Good business sense. Well. A very, very good business sense. Did I this mean, come from Dr. Tom as well? It came from Dr. Tom, yes. That, oh, there was no waste. I mean, there couldn't be waste. I mean, he was doing it on terribly tight budgets and ticket prices were not enormous. And um, the finances then, as there always, must have been a headache to him. And there were other headaches too. Dr. Tom Walsh had been director of the festival for its first 16 years. But as is documented in Corina Daly's new book, The History of Wexford Opera Festival, 1951-2021, to as the festival's success grew, relations between himself and the Executive Council had become complicated. And some argued for a more professional approach. 1966 was his last year as director. But looking back at his achievement, Rodney Milnes, editor of Opera Magazine, offered this evaluation. We hadn't had the great Donizetti revival of the 60s and 70s. So when he did uh, Anna Bolena, for instance, that really was a step forward. And I think in those days, anyway, uh, Italian opera wasn't really considered 
in quotes, respectable by the musical establishment. And I think it was quite a, a brave thing to spend the first 10, 12, 15 years of, of the Wexford Festival concentrating almost entirely on 19th century Italian opera. It must have been very refreshing. You said in your lecture that a number of Wexford operas were taken up by the major houses later on, a case in point being Mozart's uh, La Finta Giardiniera. Yes, it? absolutely. That, that was uh, an unheard of opera in those days. It was never done. It did take a bit of time for the message to get through, but now you'll find it being done all over Europe. It's now a sort of standard Mozart opera, which it certainly wasn't in those days. That showed the most amazing um, foresight. And another aspect of his enterprise was to present singers that weren't so well known in those days. Yes, that's something that's continued all, all the way through the festival. Um, in those early days you hear of completely unknown singers like Janet Baker or Mirella Freni or Giacomo Aragal. That was, a, again, an extraordinary foresight. It's something that all opera companies, without a lot of money, try and do is try and find people before they're famous. And I don't think there's been any record like Wexford's to equal that. Whatever the complications of Tom Walsh's exit in 1966, he was reticent to talk too much about it, as you'll note in this interview with Andy O'Mahony. You yourself haven't been connected with it for a number of years. No, I have not since, uh, when was, 1966 was my last year. Do you miss the, the involvement with it? Uh, no, because I am so, if I say so, so much involved in writing that... Uh, I, no, I can't say. I mean, I, I naturally, one looks back on it with tremendous pleasure, but uh, I'm so, at present, so involved in writing that really I can't say that I miss it. Are you happy with the way it, it's actually... Oh, done? indeed, yes, very happy, yes. Very happy. Tom Walsh died in November 1988, some 21 years after he had left his role as festival director. He would always be known as the founder, the first man to believe in the venture, and in the adventure, it could be said. In his last years... He turned his energies to opera history. Yes, his two-volume history of the Monte Carlo opera is, is absolutely fascinating. Rodney Milnes. I mean, you just open any page and you learn something. That was a, a real labour of, of, of love and a, and a work of great scholarship. He was also author of no fewer than three books on opera in Dublin in the 18th and 19th centuries, still regarded as the definitive works. There's always a sense in Wexford that people are not there to be seen, or not that much anyway. Writer Colm Thobin, who as a 16-year-old schoolboy had won second prize in a school's essay competition, Wexford Festival, Vanity or Prestige, was now reporting on the festival for the Gay Burn Show. Certainly there's much more to actually hear really good singing. And he emphasised the growth of fringe events in Wexford during Festival Week. Now, if you want to hear good singing in Wexford, in my view, you can go along to the opera scenes in the morning. Quite. In White's Hotel. They will, they will mix bits of Benjamin Britten with Rigoletto and Mozart, and the previous morning, suddenly the last Rose of Summer was sung. And the popularity of the festival season to the town, even to some who did not have much interest in opera. Um, it is a thing for the town as regards the extensions, for example. The pubs are open until one in the morning. Last minute preparations for tonight's opening of the completely refurbished Theatre Royal. Another monument. Damien Tiernan, RTE News 2008, at the opening of a replacement for the old Theatre Royal, Wexford. Now officially known as the Wexford Opera House. The government gave 26 million euros. 7 million was raised locally. Seating area has increased 94%. The seats themselves are a third bigger. And there's 3,500 square metres of American black walnut, sourced from managed Canadian forests and specially chosen for the better acoustics. Locals think it's all fabulous. When we came in and seen it for the first time, it's just amazing. It's the last word. It's a great for the, the founders of the Opera Festival. And then you see Dr. Tom Walsh, so he, he must be very proud looking down at honest. Not only is the Wexford Opera House itself extremely impressive, the views here from the top of the building are amazing. On a clear day, you'll be able to see Mount Leinster, 38 kilometres away, or Tuscarock Lighthouse in the other direction, 26 kilometres away. And tonight's opening will be marked by the first Late Late Show of the new season. I mean, we're delighted as well that what RT have decided to do is very much in keeping with the building. Very much a, a fantastic variety show. And I think in a way it exemplifies the fact that the building, post the Opera Festival this year, it'll be open 12 months a year for all sorts of performers, not just for opera, but for theatre, for, for dance, for stand-up comedy, etc. Damien Tiernan, in RT News, Wexford. Far cry from where it all began in the Theatre Royal in 1951. Finally, Ray Lynott's interview with Rodney Milnes, editor of Opera magazine. 
In your experience in the opera world, is there anybody that you've met quite like him, uh, this anaesthetist, uh, opera lover? There was no one like Dr. Tom, absolutely not. I mean, the, the vision was extraordinary. I can't imagine, even in a small town like Wexford, anyone else seeing the potential, seeing the unique charm of the theatre itself and of the town and the sort of spell it would cast over people who like opera all over the world. I mean, it is a, a very international audience nowadays. Um, he thought of it, he built it up. It's, it's the most bewildering achievement. English critic Rodney Mills completing that feature on the late Tom Walsh, founder of the Wexford Opera Festival, which is currently celebrating its 70th anniversary.